villains, gangsters, or faces as they prefer to be called, are the men that have been making newspaper headlines for all the wrong reasons over the past 50 years. Some are instantly recognisable, but many are not. And if you just stick a gun in your face, you're going to open up the door. I've got no worry, but even if the glass is bulletproof, and you know it's bulletproof, you're still going to open up that, because you're not going to trust your life against a bit of glass. Men like Eddie Richardson, Paul Ferris, Frankie Fraser, and Walter Norville, who have inspired fear and respect in equal measure for decades. People did fear me, yeah, because I was dangerous. In this new series, some of Britain's most infamous and influential characters have agreed to go on camera and tell it how it was and is. All of a sudden I went, <laughs> I went you move, I'll blow your fucking head off. Obviously, like, I didn't know that, but big gun in me head like that. I went, ah. So I took a dive when the shot went off, obviously, to get me in the motor. And after I got my main motor, I waited two seconds and I took a dive on the front door and I slammed the front door behind us and got behind the brick walk. And that's when the uh, bullets saw kind of coming through the front door. I've had uh, aggravated burglary, torture, um, people being kidnapped and broken legs, broken arms, um, blackmail, racketeers, extortion. I've been done for everything you can think of. I'm not a electrician or a plumber or a dentist or anything like that. I'm a crook and uh, I get back into serious crime and it paid dividends for the next five years. My name is Bernard O'Mahony. I was a friend of the Cray Twins and a member of the infamous Essex Boys firm. I know this world, I know the faces, and I'm going to give you a no-holds-barred history of the British criminal underworld. Manchester has always been synonymous with organised crime. There's always been a strong gang culture and in recent years, the city has seen a surge in drug-related violence. One of the city's most infamous firms was the Quality Street Gang. In the 60s, 70s and early 80s, they ran the city's crime scene. One of its key members was local legend, Jimmy the Weed Donnelly. Over the years, he's been a boxing promoter, a publican and a hotelier. Jimmy was immortalised when Thin Lizzy wrote a song about him, Johnny the Fox meets Jimmy the Weed. I was working in Smithfield Market and uh, I was working for a firm, uh, Woods, and uh, a guy working on the stall there one day said, OK, now he, he grows on you, this fellow, he's like a weed. Uh, I was only 16 uh, years of age at the time. And that was it from, that's carried right throughout my life. Jimmy and members of the QSG used to drink at the Wally Range Hotel, whose landlady was Phyllis Linus. She had a young son there that was always playing the guitar and, and uh, in small groups and things like that. And we got to know him. And then over the years, he became famous and then he formed the uh, the, the band Thin Lizzy. So of course, as time went on, and uh, one particular time, we're all in uh, Italy and we've come back, we've gone into the uh, bar for a drink, and Philly says, oh, the boys are back in town, I'm gone for them. And with that, it clicked and uh, he wrote the song, the boys are back in town. The QSG wasn't an organised firm like the Crays or the Richardsons in London. It was more of a loose collection of local criminals who came together for specific jobs when it suited them. Their reputation spanned the entire country. Oh, well, we, you know, we was massive. Uh, they were all over the city. You know, nightclub owners, pub owners, restaurant owners, they, you know, they'd look up to us and uh, they went out of the way if we walked in, it was like royalty. We, we went into any of the bars, we just walk in and the drinks were free. We didn't want it, we paid our way. But you know, sometimes it happened and the, 
and what have you. But we knew that if some fucking idiots walked in and caused problems or anything like that, they only had to pick the phone up, they'd know whereabouts we was, what club we was in, and uh, we'd whip round there and we'd soon sort it out for, for them. And not only that, I suppose, you know, a lot of some places we didn't go in. They just had to say, hey, you know who owns this, or I've got a share in here, the QST, and they'd fuck off, and that was the end of it. Without doubt, the QSG were both feared and respected, and Jimmy himself had a violent reputation. Um, back in them days, uh, well, I think I've always been a violent person. Um, all my life. And um, it's hard to explain that one, but, uh, you know, I've used everything from a knife to a gun and uh, you know it's just a case that it had to be at the time no regrets over it do it all again but uh, I was never a big fella and some of these people I came up against was like six foot odds and when I stand up and he would have no chance so to level it out the hammer or the axe or the knife came in and yes I've been violent all my life always have been People knew that if they did anything that would upset us, that, you know, that something would happen, there'd be a return, they would, and whatever it was, whatever, the, whatever it deserved, it was meted out. So no, I don't think people feared us, but they knew that they would get hurt if they crossed us in any way, or as we put it, fucked us. And, and that was it, so they knew. And if, they, if it was like Jimmy Swords, uh, they, they knew. If they offended any of the, the firm, that, that something would happen back. The QSG were involved in organising protection rackets, fraud and armed robberies throughout the country. Are there any specific crimes you can talk about that the QSG committed? There's plenty, but I wouldn't... Uh... I wouldn't mention anything, uh, you know, uh, of what was done. Uh, but I do know that in them days there was, there was a lot of robberies uh, that was done. Well, the, the, the police were, were getting increasingly frustrated, weren't they, by the lack of convictions? Well, that was right. Uh, that was right. Um, well, you know, in all fairness, uh, uh, Joe Swords and Vinnie Schiavo did get charged with uh, and they got the old custom bank robbery. Um, they, they went to um, Shrewsbury Crown Court and was found not guilty. The police had long believed that Jimmy Donnelly and his brother Arthur were working with the IRA and may have even been connected to the huge bomb that ripped through Manchester in 1996. Many of the QSG were said to have Irish connections. You know, looking at looking at it on paper, and he was a policeman investigating, you'd see our connections. Well, you know, you would think, hey, these guys are at it over here, and what have you, because there was people going over to Ireland and coming backwards and forwards. Uh, there was lots of things that was done. There was a few robberies, the banks in, in Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. So, uh, you know, they, I could see where it was coming from. A few of the Irish boys did come over and did go on a couple of nights out with certain members of the QSG. So there is a connection, but there's certainly none for doing anything over there. In 1986, Deputy Chief Constable of Greater Manchester Police, John Stalker, was running the shoot to kill investigation in Northern Ireland. However, he was suspended from his job over alleged connections and friendships with the QSG and the local businessman named Kevin Taylor. As far as I'm concerned, Stalker never ever gave any information to us and we never gave any information to him. And uh, it was a liberty what happened to him. Can you explain who Kevin Taylor is? Because you just said I was a Yeah, Kevin, Kevin Taylor was a local guy that 
had a car business as well. A bit of a, well, he wasn't a bit of, he was a big gambler, big time gambler. And that's how he made his living. Uh, then he went in the car business uh, and he became uh, big in the Conservative Party. He became the treasurer of the local branch. And he, he started doing a lot of building work in uh, the Salford area, Broughton and around there. Uh, he built a lot of properties there, but still say, stayed pals with the firm. And on occasions, uh, we'd lend him money. I lent him money personally, uh, which he paid, his back, paid me back. And then, then of course, uh, Stalker was his pal. He told us that. Uh, he never asked for anything out of us, Kevin Taylor, and we never asked Kevin Taylor if he could get Stalker to do, to do any favours. Um, Kevin was a stand-up guy. But anyway, uh, they ruined him, the police, uh, when they went into his banks and told him that he was a gangster and a fraudster. Uh, and that was it, and his business collapsed. Uh, and then he got awarded uh, two or three million quid when he won his case against the police. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't live to enjoy it. You know, he died a couple of years after that. Jimmy is now a pensioner, living quietly in a residential community in the heart of Manchester. His days of living a lavish lifestyle behind him. Well, well, the thing is, like everything else in age, the QSG, uh, we all had different interests. Everybody in the firm was, was, was wealthy. Uh, we didn't need the aggravation uh, really anymore. Most people, including Jimmy Swords, moved out of the city to bought the big houses, including myself. And we moved out and uh, of course we used to meet and uh, still meet two or three nights a week and go out for meals together and 20 handed. And to this day, you know, part of them still do. And no regrets? No regrets whatsoever. Jimmy's brother, Arthur, is one of the most infamous faces in Manchester. Once dubbed the Freddy Foreman of the North West, he works out of a scrapyard in the city centre. Over the years, he's been connected to a wide range of criminal activity, including counterfeiting, drugs, fencing stolen goods and protection rackets. Many people believe that he was the real godfather of Manchester, pulling the strings behind his more flamboyant brother. All them lads there in the QSG was all nice people, and still are, who is but alive. They're all nice people. And they kept this town under control, not with threats of violence or threats of this, threats of that, because it was nice people, seen about, they all worked locally, well respected, you know. Some was working, uh, all the main nightclubs in Manchester, done all electric work and all that. It was like a community then, Manchester. And them lads made sure everything was run straight. No trouble in Moss Side, was there? No, none of that. None no. of it. All the old Jamaican no. boys used to come in the clubs and what have you. No trouble, no trouble, uh, Chinatown or any, there was no trouble. Was uh, a, all the way around. There was a kid down there in, in Moss Side called Don Sony. And uh, like I say, he's more than our Jimmy's area, but Don Sony, he supplied all the beer for the Sabines and everything. He run Moss Side. He run Moss Side. And he, uh, his but wife. He was with us, Don Sony. And they had a kid called, uh, Co uh, what's it not? Uh, Cottonley, Billy. No, we're not Billy. Anyway, but uh, even then, you know, it was a two way thing. So, so what There's changed no, no Gucci's and fucking all them. What, what, what changed it then? What changed it? Well, I, I, I think... I what? Think Let me say that. It was a fear, but not a fear like, it's like, say, like one person. It was a fear of, like, fucking hell, if we cause any aggro in here like that, the fucking QSG will be coming after us. We don't want that. And, and so it, it became a verbal thing. It was just... And it was acknowledged all over, don't cause any fucking aggro. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've read in the media, um, Arthur Donnelly, Freddie Foreman of the of the Northwest. Well, who the fucking hell made that up? I've not got a clue. <laughs> you know, I've you know, I, I'm, I'm sat sat in my fucking shit. I've got no Rolls Royces. I've got no Rolls Royces. I'm old age fucking pensioner. And like, as regards my money, you know, nobody can fucking rob me. It's uh, I own this fucking gaff here. No, but I think the implication of the Freddie Foreman was gangster, do you know what I mean? Well, that's what they do, don't they? The press do that. 
We've done more for people in this town than a lot of people. A lot of, a lot of, you know, hard work and whatever for people. And fucking giving money to fucking charities and all that. No, we're, we're regular people. And like, we've, we've lived our life the way, the way, we've, never the way took, we've lived. Never it. took a penny off a working man. Never. I mean, we are part of the history of Manchester. You know, and I'm beginning to realise this, you know, it's like, you know, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing, what I'm doing here now. I mean, I, you know, and I try to put the record straight a little bit if you can. I suppose it's impossible, but the thing is, we are, we are, and they are, all them lads should rename, re, <laughs> remain nameless, they're all good, good kids and, and serve this town well. Crime figures reveal that in 1984, 89 armed robberies had been carried out in Manchester. 12 months later, that figure had risen to 139. A new generation of villains had clearly taken over where the QSG had left off. One of them was a young lad from Salford called Paul Massey. Uh, he was born in the 60s. How uh, Salford changed um, from then until now? Well, as you know, in the 60s and um, the 70s and all that, <coughs> it was more, um, there was no drugs in the scene, was there? Like, there wasn't cannabis in them days. There was, there was no, what's the name, cocaine about, no heroin about, or out like that in them days. So it was a better, in my eyes, a better um, community of people was better. You know what I'm saying? So what did you get up to uh, around Salford when you was growing up? Well, I started getting in trouble around about eight years old. And I think I got lots of it was about 12, end up in preschool. What's, what sort of stuff did you get up to? Maybe, maybe burglaries and things like that. And, um, you know, might do a few snatches here and there, where you're getting wages or other things. So uh, when, when were you first sent away? I was first sent to, uh, well, sent to preschool when I was about 12 years old. So that's 72? 72, yeah. And what was that like? Well, it was pretty uh, rough, to be truthful with you, because it was, it was pretty um, violent towards you, the staff in the pre yeah. in preschools in them days. And uh, plus, you had to, um, had to fight in them days to look after yourself, because there was no human rights laws in them or anyone protecting you. You have to protect yourself. So, so do you think approved school was a mistake? Yeah, I think what they, do, what they should have really done is tried a method of rehabilitating me or prevention, which I was never given any of that. I was just heavy handed by the police because even when I was a young kid, the police would beat you up, which they did. Your father would beat you up for getting in trouble as well. Then you go to the proof school and you're getting beat up in there off, off um, the staff who's running the place. So you come anti, you come anti, anti-social and anti-government, anti-police and everything because everyone's attacking you from each angle. Massey's anti-social behaviour and rebellious views came to the attention of Ken Keating, a well-known anarchist and political activist in Salford. Ken died in 2010, but his son Sean agreed to talk to me. You know, it's no secret that they said Paul Massey was Mr. Big and Ken Keaton was like using, it was like as a polit his political aim was to bring, bring down the council. Well, yeah, that's, that's what they said. They said that, you know, Paul was the Mr. Big, the youth of Salford were the foot soldiers and Ken Keaton was this Machiavellian, guy who was like politicising the youth of, of Salford. Because your, your dad took the belief that the, the chief of police at the time had declared war on the Salford youth, didn't he? He did declare war on Salford youth. I was there, I was at that meeting, and Jim, Inspector Jim Tumner stood up and he pointed right out to everybody that was in that audience and he went, I'm telling you now, you will not win. GMP is declaring war on you scum. That declaration from the police sparked outrage amongst the Salford youth and they took to the streets. It's like a, it's like a, a, a pressure cooker. It can only take so much before it explodes, like the riots did. And when I pulled up, 
I just seen loads of police jumping out of vans, basically chasing people about, provoking people, just poking people. I seen it with my own eyes. Then people was all foaming each other, turning up. The police was rushing at gangs because people just stood about watching what was going on. Because like, you see 30, 40 police vans pull up, young kids come out and have a look, as you know, knows there. And then the police are chasing them about, running at them. And it's sort of like, loads of anger just come from nowhere. I just seen like people fucking coming from the estates, people running down these entries, coming off as ghettos and everything. And that's I just never seen in my life so much anger in them young kids' faces. When they were throwing the bricks at the police, it wasn't that it was like so much feminine, so much aggression. They wasn't interested in the shops, they weren't interested in the properties or anything like that, them kids on that day. They just worked a full battle with the police and he took it right to them and the police ran off. I was there, they ran, they abandoned Salford. Then the kids attacked Salford precinct because the police abandoned it. That's why the police paid the money to the people because of the damage, because they left the city. And the reason they left the city, not only could they get chased off by, because they've, they've hounded the Salford youth and the Salford teenagers so much. And that day I seen that anger spill onto the streets against the police. It wasn't about like, looting, it wasn't about smashing shops or properties. This was police and the Salford anger. And that's what happened that day. The doll got burnt down, the rent offices got burnt down. You actually go back and you look at previous acts of civil unrest, riots, whatever you want to call them, yeah? Everything gets destroyed. Nobody gives a fuck, they just burn it all to the ground because it's about destruction, yeah? In 1992, yeah? Carpet World was targeted because Carpet World, right, had, had brought a policy in where they were charging residents of Odsall and Salford Precinct a pound a floor. Because there's a lot of high-rise flats, they thought we can nick an extra pound note off here, off all the residents by charging them a pound a floor extra. And that was just to get somebody to measure your carpet, right? The Dole office is an obvious target anyway, yeah? The rent office was an obvious target because people believed that the actual records of who, rolled, who owed rent was in there. As it turns out, it wasn't. It was right at the town hall, but, you know. So, <laughs> Get them next time. Yeah, but, you know, it's <laughs> like... it's. What I'm trying to say is there was nothing of any use to the community targeted or attacked in 1992. Simple as but, that. But, there was no no doctor's surgeries burnt down. There was no schools. There were no schools burnt down, and they're always the, usually the first target in a riot, because it's the kids in it, you know. I remember vaguely that um, I know a few police fans were shot up, and um, the police were shot at, and there was fires all over the city. And um, I mean, it was a right destruction of damage done, and um, apparently. <coughs> I got accused by um, someone from Salford Council that I was the Mr Big behind it all. Mr Burrows? Mr Burrows, yes. Which, I've never been arrested for any of this or even pulled in for it or questioned about any of this. And then since he's made that comment about that in the paper, he's just made my life pretty hell with the police. Following the riots, the police abandoned large areas of Salford. Massey, with the agreement of King Keating, then took it upon himself to protect the neighbourhoods. No crack, no smack, no hard drugs in Salford. Burglars. If somebody was found to be burgling or known to be burgled, they were spoken to. If somebody was selling hard drugs, they were spoken to. Usually with a battle here. <laughs> well, you know... Well, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. By, but, you know, by, by I, I, any I, means I, necessary. I, I, I agree with it, but essentially your father and others had assumed the role of the police, really. They, 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 were, they were policing Salford. Well, you know... When Ken Keating passed away, Salford turned out to pay its respects. And so was Salford missing? Salford would definitely miss Ken. He won't get another Ken. He'll never get another man like him. He's a one-off. It wasn't, um, I was going to say, it wasn't to cause disruption, Ken. 
as people try and make him out, he was there to fight for people's rights. And, you know, if someone was police was harassing you or anything like that, he'd support you. He'd fight the police in legal ways of paperwork and marches and anything else. He's just an amazing man. I used to find it frustrating because I used to think, why can't my dad be like everybody else's dad? Down the pub, getting pissed, getting stoned, you know, doing what everybody else's dad seemed to do. And as I've got older, I've come to realise that he, he didn't just hate a foreigner for the fact it was a foreigner. Yeah, he was fighting again. He was fighting a bigger battle, and that bigger battle was against oppression, the New World Order, the banks. It was everything. My dad. Was, my dad wasn't just an advisor to the criminal fraternity. My dad was a political animal, and that's what his whole life was spent doing, fighting oppression and, you know, any kind of authority that, that, that would repress you or I, and that's what he spent his life doing. In the early 90s, Manchester's emerging music scene meant that it had some of the most popular clubs in the country. Venues such as the Hacienda were meeting the insatiable demand for both dance music and ecstasy. And club owners were hiring the hardest men that they could find to try and keep control of the lucrative market. OK, the apartment block across the street bears no resemblance to uh, the world-famous nightclub that once stood there. That was the scene of the uh, Hacienda, which was uh, probably one of the most famous nightclubs in Europe at the time, because of the rave scene, you know, bands like the Stone Roses, and that all started their careers there. Uh, but unfortunately, where there's money to be made, you'll find villains, and where you find villains, you'll find violence. And uh, the Hacienda was the scene, or the cause, of what became known as the Door Wars in Manchester. And what happened in the Door Wars? Uh, exactly what it says on the tin, really. You know, various criminal gangs from Cheetham Hill, Salford, uh, Wally Range, other areas of Manchester, knew there was a lot of money to be made in that club. And so um, they were all vying to take the door over so they could control the lucrative drugs market. The Salford lads was known for selling the ecstasy at the time, because they, they used to sell the ease in there. And the police used to say it was me. It wasn't me at all. It was people doing their own thing. But just because they seen near me, they, they start saying it's me as well. But it wasn't me. I had nothing to do with it. When we was younger and all that, we all, we all like a, a fight, but we only fought with people who wanted a fight. We didn't go like beat people up for no reason. We wouldn't do anything like that. It's like you go to town or you go about where and it's gangs out. You know when it, you want to fight and you don't. We, we have a good fight and a tear up. But as, it, but as the years went on, there was more people from Salford in the town, more gangs from Salford in the town, more gangs from Moss Side, more gangs from Cheetahville in the town. So it was coming like a bit of a, a gang culture, Manchester Town Centre in the 80s and 90s, where you had to be firm up to survive in there. But the only thing with the Salford boys, what I will give them, they always stuck together. When it was a problem, you fought one, you had to fight them all. So it was a very powerful firm at the time in the 80s and 90s where they just weren't backing away from anybody. But they wouldn't cause problems unless it come at them. Pitch battles were fought and won by Massey and his firm, the Salford Lads, as they sought to gain control of pub and club security contracts. On one occasion, the Salford firm met in a club with the Cheatham Hill firm. Both were heavily armed and ready for what could have been one of the bloodiest and most brutal encounters in British gang history. What happened was a, there was a fight in a club in Manchester with uh, one of the black lads from uh, Cheetah Mill and a Salford lad. Anyway, they had a one-to-one -one the next day and um, the, the black man from Cheetah Mill had bits, bit, ears bit off him, bits bit off him here and there. Then it was all over. That was to stop the, the Salford and Cheetah Mill falling out because I know the oldest yeah, Cheetah Mill boys. But then another incident happened two weeks later like that. And then um, we tried to arrange a fight with the kids from Cheetah Mill, with the kids from Salford, and they, they, weren't, they weren't having it. So if you want it, it's going to have to be guns. So 
we was in the club and I think it was Saturday night in the conspiracy. And then I've seen about 60, 70 men walk in with long max on them, vest and whatever, them valleys and everything we had on. They come towards me, pulled loads of things out. And then next thing I just said, you better look around. I just turned around and realised that they were surrounded with men with guns. So I said, put them down or it's going down. So the kid were like that. I went out to the sofa, lads. And then eventually we shook hands and we sorted out without, without it going to um, a proper serious war with cheating mill. Fortunately, it turned out nicely where it could have been a massacre because there's over 2,000 people in that club and there must be about 60, 70 guns on the, on the scene of that night in there. And it just took one, one person to pull the trigger and it would have been chaos. The first of many attempts by the authorities to bring Massey down failed miserably. He was acquitted of violent disorder at a nightclub after the main prosecution witness decided to go on holiday rather than face him in a trial. Another face from Salford who saw himself as a defender of the community was Wayne Barker. Like Massey, he was expelled from school and fought on the streets from a young age gaining his reputation with his courage and his fists. My dad couldn't control me. I was, I was fighting as people coming to the house all the time. And, you know, it was always my about me fighting. And I didn't see anything wrong in me fighting, to be quite truthful. I liked it. I enjoyed it, you know. And that's not to say I'm a bully. I just, it's just what I did and just what I liked. Uh, the school expelled me, obviously. And then, um, there was a, there's an old character still around in Manchester, he's 80 odd year old, called Curly Low. Very, very well known, Kenneth Low. Um, I would suppose you would determine Ken Curly Low as an old school sort of gangster sort of fella, you know. And him and my father took me to um, a gypsy encampment in Partington. Introduced me to a man called Huey Burton also known as, as Big Just, Uriah Burton, King of the Gypsies, who was a fist-fighting man. And for want of a better expression, I was deposited there. Uh, and it was, it was really, when I, in hindsight, when you look back, I'm a, a mature man now, and I look back at my life, and I think, really surreal, really, when you think about it. You know, there's like hundreds of travellers on this site, and I, I couldn't speak, in, I couldn't speak Romany. And uh, I had a bit, of, a bit of a tough time about it uh, as, as it went, you know. And uh, but for the tough times, it, there was good times. I was messing with horses. I learned to ride. I learned about chicken fighting. I learned how to get a living. I learned to live on my wits. Uh, and I was pitted against young boys around my own age—12, 13, 14, 15-year-old boys. And I'd be 12, 12, 13 year old. And uh, I won a few and I lost a couple and then we went over to Ireland and I, I, I had a few fights at Phoenix Park and I fought Cashel Horse Fair in Tipperary, we used to go to all the horse fairs and bang on a skull. Fighting young boys my own age, you know, bits of sport, 20, 30 pounds, whatever a man could afford, you did where you looked, you did similar age, similar size, similar weight and you'd get to it and some you'd win, some you'd lose, you know, but there was no aminosity about it, it was a sporting thing. Uh, cultural thing really, a gypsy cultural thing. Uh, and although I'm not a gypsy, I was accepted into that culture eventually, you know. By the time Barker was 14 years old, his adopted gypsy family had arranged his first fight for money. On the Saturday evening, Eugene told me, you're fighting tomorrow. So I said, okay. Didn't think nothing of it, I thought I was fighting a boy, you know. Next morning, I was told I was fighting Jimmy. And I knew Jimmy was a man, he was 36 years old, and he was a fit man, he wasn't a fat 36, he was ripped to death. And I remember sitting on the grass thinking, this is, uh, this is a bit heavy, I said, am I, I going to get through this or what, you know? But uh, we had a fight, we had gloves on. 49 men paid a pound apiece to watch it. It was a winner take all. And that was really the start of my professional fighting career. 
because that was the first time I'd ever been paid to fight, properly paid, you know. I mean, we had little bets and different things as, as a kid, but I fought a man and, and I thought then, I thought, I'm a man now, I'll beat a man. I don't want to fight boys no more. I didn't fight any more boys. It was 18, 19 year old young men I was fighting. Wayne's love of fighting resulted in him falling foul of the law and ending up in prison. Whilst on remand at Strangeways Prison, he found himself locked in a cell with a man who'd murdered the child of a family friend. What had happened was two guys in a stolen car who was driving through Wally Range and some young boys had been scrumping apples, throwing them at cars, taking a chunk out and throwing them at cars, as kids do. The car stops, two men get out and chase these boys. No one knows who actually threw the, the apple at that particular car, but the, the one they actually caught was Lewiston Pantry. And one held him, and the other one stabbed him seven or nine times. The boy climbed over the wall and died in the vicar's, in, in the church garden. The reverend or the vicar was watering his plants. Uh, a lot of people come to me cell. Uh, I passed four when they open you up for your tea. This kid was too scared to go down for his tea. So uh, I've stopped the people coming in the cell. No, 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 leave him, leave him. This is me, I'll deal, I'm dealing with this. And I've put everyone away from the cell. And I've, I've, I've made the kid feel a bit secure that I'm going to protect him. I had no intention of protecting him. I was livid. I was young, I was stupid, I was headstrong. And um, I'm not bragging about what I did. Uh, but in the same, I don't feel no regrets for what I did, if that makes any kind of sense, because this nasty, evil man had killed a little boy. And uh, I beat him up and, uh, and, uh, and uh, I'd done some nasty things to him. He sustained a, a, a lot of pain and a lot of injuries, no facial injuries. It was all done systematically, you know. Um, I cut him with razor blades, I sliced him, knots and crosses, cut skin off his feet. It was a bit sick, really, when, you, when, you, when I talk about it, but that's what I did. And I cut sheets up and I bandaged him up. And I told him if he told anyone, you know, he'd get seriously dealt with. And uh, he didn't tell anybody for I think it was about three or four weeks. And the only way he come to tell anybody was he went to, to a court appearance and the social workers was wanting to give him some clothing, wanting to change clothes. And he wanted to do it in private. He wasn't allowed to do it in private. And the social workers made him take his shirt off. When he took his shirt off, he seen all these handmade bandages where he's wrapped up on his arms and his legs and his body. And he said, what are these? And he's ripped them off and he's obviously opened all the wounds up which have become infected because they've not been treated. And then he come in and he told them, Wayne Bark has done this and this and this and this and this, bang, bang, bang. Next thing I know, the screws come to my cell, they take me out, bang, they take me down into an office, uh, into an interview room, I get interviewed. Gareth Hughes, my lawyer, was there and I was subsequently charged with att attempted murder. Following his eventual release from prison, Barker returned to the ring, turned professional and travelled to America to box in some of the country's most famous gyms. He went on to fight in Venezuela against the world super middleweight champion, Fulio Bell. But when he returned to the UK, he was forced to face his most formidable opponent, cancer. I thought my party was over, and it was a, I was in a very, 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 very strange place, um, mentally. And they let me out after about six or seven days, as soon as I could go to the bathroom properly. And I come out and they had staples all up here. And the first day out, I got in my Land Rover and I come from my house to the club. It was just normal. 
Some friends took me out for some lunch. And uh, I, I walked a mile. I, I started, I thought I'll leave my car there and I walk, I'm gonna walk home. I'd gone down to about nine and a half stone. So I walked just, just about a mile and I had to phone my wife to come and collect me. And um, I was fucked. Frankie Fraser's son David got to know Wayne over the years and went to visit him just before he died. I was absolutely shocked, man. I was really shocked. Because when you go in his house, there's a photograph of him as a very healthy man as a fighter. And he's an healthy man in the photograph. And when I walked into the room, he was a shell of a man, very thin, very pale. Um, and he was dying, and he knew he was dying. But his pride and his courage that was with him, and he had a lovely, lovely, caring family, and they was with him all the way. And it was sad to see him like that. And of course, the memories of Jack brought back to us as well. And I'll always remember when we went back home, back in Roy's car, going back down towards London. It was a very quiet journey, and no one wouldn't say nothing. It was very, very summer. It was, we was hurt. We was hurt to see our friend Harry was. Then eventually, um, I, I always remember this, Wayne saying to me, we went downstairs and we were sitting there talking, actually into one of the, one of the rooms downstairs. I think you, you might have seen him when he was laid out in his coffin in that room. That's the room where we were sitting and talking to him. And Wayne was still trying to put deals together. And we were putting deals together and he said, I'll phone you up later and et cetera, et cetera, you know. But I knew deep inside that he was dying and it wouldn't be long. Then we get the phone call a week or so later that he died. And well, I was heartbroken to be honest with you. I really choked because he, he just was one of those people I bonded with as a closeness. And I went to the funeral. Um, me, Roy Hilda, Darkie Smith, and, and an, an ex-fighter called Eric. And we travelled up there, spent the night in a hotel, and then we went to the funeral the next day, but it was very sad. Cancer had claimed Wayne Barker, but it was the authorities who eventually brought down his counterpart, Paul Massey. He was sentenced to 14 years imprisonment for stabbing a man outside a Manchester nightclub. Massey's close friend Paul Ferris was also in the sights of the police. He'd been commuting from Manchester to London on a regular basis when he was arrested in possession of a cache of machine guns. When I was arrested in London, uh, I was unaware that I was under observation by this new tactical unit. Uh, which involved MI5, soccer, or the kind of whole uh, law enforcement outfits that were all put together. It was never fitted up. People say that, you know, it was questionable about your arrest. None questionable about the arrest, other than the fact that had I known there were guns in the box, I'd have still done it anyway, so I'm not going to make any uh, uh, or gloss over things or, or make any excuses. The fact of the matter is, I was arrested, or, or to coin a, an English phrase, done bang to rights. As Paul Ferris discovered, the police in London have far more resources than any other force. Regardless of how powerful you are or how powerful you think you are,